Welcome everybody to another edition of the Anthony Peak Consciousness Hour. This one is going to be particularly interesting for me, and um, because many many people think that the work I do tends to get out there into certain areas and certain types of individuals read my work, um, but what I've discovered over the years is that my my writing gets under the the nose of some quite interesting individuals around the world. Um, and, for instance, I'm reminded of a gentleman who wrote to me a few years ago who was designing a line of men's underwear based upon the ideas you know, I put forward in entertainment. Um, I've never really quite grasped how that worked, but effectively he's been very, very successful in terms of it. If you want to check it out, it's called Bozak Clothing. Other individuals have contacted me. I've had psychiatrists, psychologists, I've had neurologists, um, parapsychologists and various other individuals. But the area that I'm most delighted in people contacting me is is people in the music industry. And the reason is that uh, I'm an absolute mad music fan, you know, in, in terms of my music. My musical taste is extremely broad, way back from buying my first album back in uh, late 1969 when I bought Led Zeppelin III carrying forward throughout the years and my interest in music continues to this day where I'm, I'm particularly interested in American indie music, um, alt country and various other areas and those of you who follow me on my Facebook page will know that my tastes are somewhat somewhat um, wide for a person of 62 years of age but that's one of those things that makes me rather weird. I was therefore absolutely delighted when around about 18 months ago I received a message on Facebook by a gentleman called Charlie, Charlie Farron. Now, I had been aware of Charlie's work um, through many ways and many sources. For, for instance, one of the areas of Charlie's work I was particularly interested in was his involvement um, with the supporting of the band Boston. Um, but his musical career and his musical pedigree is absolutely phenomenal. I don't think there's anybody in the music business Charlie doesn't know or hasn't played with or worked with it sometime in the past. So what we're planning to do with this particular show is we're going to get to know Charlie a little bit more, a little bit about his background and how he got into music and everything else. And then we'll move on to why he's on this show and particularly what it is about his interests um, that, that, that generates him wanting to write music that is actually the music of the kind of stuff that we're very interested in here. So without further ado, Charlie, how's things over there in Massachusetts? Things are fantastic. Um, uh, it's a little bit rainy today, but we need the rain for, for my tomatoes. And, uh, <laughs> your tomatoes. That, that's hardly a rock star thing, is it? You know, you're concerned about your tomatoes. <laughs> Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm working on my uh, what will be my my eleventh studio album of original material, and it will be my seventeenth overall release. Um, and uh, a little bit, a little bit stumbled because I broke my finger. I broke this finger in my left hand, and so I can't play. It's been in a split for two and a half months, and. Uh, by the end of this month, I'll be back on stage performing. So uh, uh, it put a little put a little kink in my recording project, but uh, I'm really excited about the way it's coming out. Well, probably it could end up with some kind of very very interesting guitar style if you're actually got one finger that doesn't function in the correct way. So you, you could slide try slide guitar or something. A couple of years ago, I actually cut the tip of my right finger, middle finger off. I won't show you that one, but. Uh, it's fine, but uh, uh, that I didn't even miss a gig because your right hand, I could I could adjust, but with the left hand, you, you, it's a very important hand. It's an important finger in your left hand. Um, but uh, so I've been I've been kind of healing and, and working on the vocals on this new record, which uh, I'm going to be calling Guitar and Voice, and it's um, it's one single. It's the first time I've done a record like this. It's a single guitar. In a single voice, there's no harmonies, there's no percussion, um, and the trick is to get it to swing the right way, and to get the lyrics right, to get the melody right, um, and it's coming out fantastic, and uh, it's, it will shine a spotlight on my uh, self-taught unique guitar style. 
Wow. Now on that, so how did you get into the music business? I mean, it's one of the things we all dream of as kids is doing it, but you've actually done it and lived the dream. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how, you know, where you're from and everything else and how your, your, your musical career was developed, because I'm, I'm fascinated to know, so please fire away. I, I grew up in Malvern, Massachusetts, and you and I were talking um, earlier about how the cities in New England – I like the cities named after the cities of England, and uh, there's a lot of, I live in Chelmsford now, um, and there's a Chelmsford, England. Um, I grew up in Malden. I had three sisters, and we were kind of a musical family. We all sang, and we sang out, you know, Irish family. We would sing out. We didn't sing with little, little voices. We sang big voices, and I always thought that's the way you sang, and when I went to school, I remember we the, the teacher said, okay, everyone stand up and let's sing. And everybody stood up with their little first grade voices and sang. And I sang with a big Barry family voice, you know. <laughs> and they turned and looked at me. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe this is what I'll do, you know. Um, my older sister had a band. Um, they used to practice at my house. There were uh, four girls, uh, guitar, six-string guitar, 12-string guitar, banjo, and one girl played tambourine. Two Irish girls and two Jewish girls, and it was kind of like, kind of like Wild Colonial Boy meets Hava the Gila, and <laughs> around uh, at, at the uh, homes, a lot of Jewish people in, in Malden, and um, they performed in churches and they performed in synagogues and they performed. I just thought that was the neatest thing in the world. You could actually have your own band. Uh, so of course I started playing guitar, and. Uh, Started it probably about the eighth or ninth grade. Started trying to form band, um, uh, and it wasn't until I was in high school uh, when I had a band. That we performed at a, a, a show called Junior Varieties at Malden High School. There's a the junior class sponsors a variety show, and my band. It was a three piece band called Blue Willow, and uh, we played a song that I had written, and we won. And I can remember thinking to myself, all right, this is what I'm going to do, right? Um, I, I had the bug by then. Of course, I went to college, uh, which is now called Salem State University. And at least in the States, I was majoring in English literature. And at least in the States, you're required to take these courses that have nothing to do with what your major is. And I remember one day I was walking across the quad on my way to a weather and climate class, not wanting to go. And uh, and there was a band in the lobby of the student union building. And I can remember thinking to myself, and I remember going in and seeing them and thinking to myself, what am I doing? This is what I should be doing. I'm going to go to weather and climate. What? I don't need to be taught about that. I mean, I want to go. I should be doing this. I'd be better than these guys. So. I made up my mind that summer I joined the band and um, we were playing covers and we played all summer at one place and they wanted to, at the end of the summer, they wanted to extend us through November and I, I went with it. I didn't go back to school. Um, and I think it was a good move. Um, uh, Just very quickly, what, what kind of covers were you doing though? What, what year was this and what kind of music were you doing at that stage in terms of the covers? So, so I graduated high school in 1971, and so this would have been 72, probably 73 to 77 when I was doing covers. Um, I joined someone else's band as the lead singer. Um, there were two guitar players, a bass player and a drummer, and they were older guys, and they hired me to just be a singer. I didn't play guitar, and we played. We didn't play the kind of covers that would get us paid a lot, like the pop hits. We were playing the Deep Stones cuts and the Fleetwood Mac songs and, you know, uh, uh, Yardbird songs and, um, you know, uh, you know the, the kind of songs where you would not, not the hits, right? We were playing the songs, the guitar player songs. Uh, but we, we had an agent and we worked from, uh, you know, obviously in Boston to Philadelphia to Syracuse up to Bangor, Maine, that triangle. Um, and we worked... 45 weeks a year, and we uh, we played five to seven sets a night, five to seven nights a week, um, just crazy, 
Uh, and that's where you really learned how to be, I think. Um, uh, that band was called Live Lobster. I'm still in touch with those guys. Um, but I wanted to write. I was playing. I played guitar, and I wanted to play guitar, and I, I wanted to write my own songs. And uh, so I, what me and the guitar player in that band started another band um, where we played only songs that we wrote, and we went from working 45 weeks a year to working no weeks a year <laughs> because we had to get it going, and that was hard. Um, that band was called Balloon. And we got that band on the map on the strength of a couple of singles that I wrote uh, that got played around New England. And uh, one song was called East Coast, West Coast, and another was called Listen to the Rock. Uh, Charles Black was So what, very quickly, Charlie, on this, you know, so right early on you were writing your own material. So in terms of that, how did you build the songs? I mean, I'm always intrigued by this as to how, where a song comes from how you have your ideas, your inspiration. So let's go, uh, say, the first couple of songs you wrote. What inspired you, and how did they come about, and how did you build the song up? Well, but, you know, interestingly, I've always written on a nylon string guitar, classical guitar, uh, and then I would bring the song to the band, and then the band would turn them into a rock song. Um, uh, and, and I started off, I think, just emulating artists that I liked, um, and I learned early on that the, the best way to write and the best way to play is instead of emulating people that you admire, you you write to the things that come easy to you. You write to the you write to the guitar parts that you play well, uh, and you you write you you write songs that you sing well, songs that work well for your voice. Um, I know tons of people that try to write, and they're always trying to do things that they're not that good at. And I think, for me, what always worked was the stuff that I felt like I was good at. I always, always invented my own chords, and I always sang songs that were in the range that was comfortable for my voice. Um, I still do that to this day. I'm a better writer now than I was then, but I remember the first song uh, that I wrote that was good. I knew it was good right away. And I still perform it in my set. Uh, live shows is a song called Afraid to Fly Away. Um, I recorded it on my Deja Blue CD. Um, and I did it true to the way I wrote it, just with guitar and a voice. Uh, and it's beautiful. Um, but the funny thing is when I play it, I explain to the audience that I wrote it this way, but I brought it to the band and we turned it into a... You know, we turned it into a rock tune. It still is our best tune, but uh, uh, a, a good song works in any format. Um, so I, I've learned over the years to, to write to what comes. Now. You, don't, you shouldn't try to write. You have to, you have to be clear. You have to just be empty and let it come and, and write stuff that, that feels easy and natural for you. Um, so that's that's what I still do, and I did that then, and my best stuff was has always come out that way. So you had the band Balloon, and effectively you had a few hit singles. So what then happened from there? How did that then develop? Well, um, WBCN was the big rock station in Boston, really in New England, and um, the guy on that station who was the king was the morning guy, Charles Lacordaire. He still has an internet radio show. He lives in Hawaii now. And anything that Charles played, everybody at WBCN played. And anything that WBCN played, everybody played. And that's the way it worked then, back in the 70s. Uh, and Charles, I did a, a song on a four-track tape called Listen to the Rock, and uh, it was uh, quirky, uh, and it didn't sound like anything else on the radio, mostly because I did it in my bedroom on a four-track machine. Um, <clears throat> but Charles loved it, and he played it in, in heavy rotation. And um, suddenly, my band, who couldn't get any work, was, was getting a lot of work, and we were filling nightclubs all over New England. Um, and we released a second single called uh, East Coast, West Coast. And it was a very exciting time. I was working in a music store. Um, and I got word that Joe Perry was looking for a, a lead singer who played guitar. 
uh, and I went to, a, to, to the audition. Don Law, who's a producer. Could you just explain to the audience who Joe Perry is? There'll be people out there who some many will have know, know of him, but others won't. So you can just explain who Joe Perry is to them. So Joe is uh, from the Boston area, and he was in, he is in a band called Aerosmith, who I think everybody knows, arguably the, best, the biggest uh, rock band in America. And uh, he's currently touring with a band called uh, Hollywood Vampires with uh, Alice Cooper and with Johnny Depp uh, and various other sidemen who uh, who uh, you know worked with Guns N' Roses and uh, various big rock bands. Um, uh, so Joe is, a, is the lead guitar player and co-writer in Aerosmith. He's um, he's the you know arguably the coolest rock guitar player out there. Uh, in terms of his whole whole package, you know, his carriage and his his sound. Uh, he's a fantastic writer of guitar riffs. Um, all those cool riffs that Aerosmith plays, uh, he, he's, he contributes to that element to that band. Um, so real famous guy, real great break for me. Um, and uh, I auditioned to got that gig. And uh, our first show was... Um, my first big show was at the uh, Springfield Civic Center opening for Ozzy Osbourne, and the opening act for us was Def Leppard. So I went from rehearsing in a um, in someone's basement to rehearsing, you know, at the at the uh, Orpheum and um, Theater in Boston. And uh, we we got on that tour. I can't remember how many dates it was. It was maybe a dozen dates with with, with that lineup, uh, and that would have been nineteen. 19- 80. Uh, I was, and we, we ended up touring a lot. We toured the Dallas Cooper, uh, ZZ Top, the Kinks, uh, the Scorpions, um, Judas Priest, Kansas. I, I can't think more. ZZ Top, I might have said that. Um, we just toured it's constantly, um, probably for a year and a half. That was a co- really fun time. And, um, uh, you know, I still, from time, so I still, David Hall was the bass player in that band, and he was also the bass player in Fahrenheit, my next band, and I'm still friendly with him. I see him all the time, and I hear from Joe from time to time, uh, and the guys in the crew, and uh, that was a that was a fun time for me. I mean, I, I can but imagine, you know, I was, I was always somebody that couldn't play musical instruments, but I was always somebody that was very, very jealous of friends of mine that could. And also the, the sheer glamour of, of particularly rock music in the late 70s, uh, early 80s, and, and how wonderful it must have been. I mean, just the bands you just mentioned there are just so evocative. And funnily enough, my wife is a huge fan of Def Leppard, and I'd never really appreciated Def Leppard greatly because I tended to, to see them as being the kind of second wave of, um, of English heavy rock. You know, there was the Led Zeppelins, the Black Sabbaths, the Deep Purples, and then it seemed to go quiet. And then bands like Saxon and and various other people came up. And Def Leppard was one of those. And it was only when um, we were up in Liverpool and Def Leppard were playing at the the, the arena in Liverpool, which is my my home city. And they were playing with, um, how do I support? I can't remember who the support bands were. But they blew me away. I, I was so impressed with the... The, the sound package itself and the overall production, because years ago when I used to go to concerts, you know, they were kind of sweaty university halls kind of thing, or it would be sort of places where, you know, bands like Free and Bronco and uh, Ten Years After, people like that were playing, which is a very different sound, whereas the level of production, and I think it was Mutt Lang was the producer, I guess, of, of of them, so he really knew how to put together a sound that that, that was interesting. You know that, that you you were always worried, you're always interested as to where the music was going to go, which I think you know. And I used to listen on headphones all the time. It was the thing that I really used to love. And and for a period of time, I was interested in progressive music bands like Yes and everybody else. But my real love is much more harder driving rock. You know, and I think it always has been. So. Yeah, I mean, ZZ Top, I just love ZZ Top. It's just the whole sound of ZZ Top. It's like a kind of, 
just driving music. You know, it's really, really superb. And and Boston has very much been the home of of I know this easy topic I'm from Boston, I know from Texas, but Boston has always had its own unique sound, you know, from bands like Steely Dan. You know, lots of bands really started up there. Um and I know that you, you're on the periphery of probably one of my favorite bands of all time, which was Boston. Um, and when the first Boston album came out, I remember it was Tom Schultz or Schultz or whatever the guy's name is, that he wanted to bring out the definitive rock album of all time, that everybody would think this defined everything. And in many ways, that first Boston album did. You know, it was just superbly well done in so many ways. So if you can tell us now about the, 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 as you moved on, um, how things developed in terms of your career, because you've done this mega tour with, with these incredibly named bands. How did it then develop from there? Uh, well, um, you mentioned Def Leppard. We, I, David and I just went last week. A friend of mine plays the lead guitar in Aria Speedwagon. And they were playing at the uh, Infinity. Ario Speedwagon is still. Hold on, Ario Speedwagon is still going, are they? And they sound fantastic. And they play nothing. Wow. Like yeah. Wow. Uh, and they, they were on the bill with uh, with Les, with Def Leppard, and we went and saw them and visited with those guys last week. Um, but so so at a certain point, um, Joe switched, changed management, and the new management clearly uh, was was just focused on getting Aerosmith back together. Uh, they wanted to uh, add more Aerosmith tunes and move in the direction of getting Aerosmith back together. And and David and I, you know, we thought uh, that didn't seem that appealing to us to, to kind of hang around until Aerosmith got back together. We, we were, we were really focused on writing, writing a second record and, and making it, you know, um, and so when it became clear that, that Joe was going to get back with Harrison, David and I started writing together, and uh, we put together uh, a, a, several different lineups um, that led towards Fahrenheit. Uh, in the meantime, I had signed a, a record deal with Atlantic Records with Ahmet Erdogan, who was the founder of the label. He signed Ray Charles and the Rolling Stones and Aretha Franklin and Led Zeppelin. Um, he had Paul Rogers on the label. He had Yes on his label. Um, and he signed me to to because uh, he liked he liked my songwriting and um, uh, but felt that radio wasn't ready for that style at the time. Um, and so I was writing and working with him. He was kind of mentoring me as a songwriter, and I was also writing with David Hall. Uh, and that started to to feel like a band, um, a three piece band. And um, Atlantic and Warner's the kind of sister companies at the time they were. And um, we got, uh, I was on tour um, with, with a band that was called the New England All-Star Jam Band. And, um, and it was, uh, geez, you, you mentioned Steely Dan. Skunk Baxter was in it. Uh, Robert, uh, Roger Earl from Foghat was in it. Uh, James Montgomery. Just again, just again, just jumping in the certain names there. Skunk Baxter, what a guitarist. I mean, the guitar solo in my old school I think has to be the most perfect guitar solo anywhere. And of course, Foghat, you know, which were really good old time rock. They, they were, well, but the Foghat were British, weren't they, as I remember? Yeah. They're, they're British, I think. Um, uh, and they were they're great guys. Um, we, we toured with uh, Foghat when I was with Joe Perry. So I knew those guys. Um, and I was, had become friendly with Roger Earl, who was the drummer, who's just like a fantastic guy. He's still playing and touring with Foghat. Um, he was the drummer, and it was a the, the Rolling Stones horn section was was in the band, the Uptown Horns. Um, uh, you know, friends of mine, Johnny, John Butcher, um, uh, some guys in Boston, Barry Goodrow from Boston was in it. Uh, Fred Sheehan from Boston was in it. And we would tour around and just play songs that we all knew, uh, and it was a it was fun to do, and it was a payday, and it was something that we did while I was putting my next band Fahrenheit together. Uh, and one night, Foghat's manager came to to one of the shows, and Fahrenheit was on the bill with this All Star Jam Band. So I performed with Fahrenheit, and then they went up and performed with the Jam Band. 
And his manager saw us and called me the next day and said, I want to sign you to Warner Brothers. And I thought, well, at least let's meet, you know. Um, and because I knew that wasn't how it worked. You know, somebody doesn't just see your band and say, I want to sign you. That's not the way it really works. Uh, so I met with him, and, and I said that to him. And he said, no, I have connections. I can da, da, da. And he came to another gig with a cassette player and recorded the band on a cassette player, you know, held it up in the air. And um, we got a call from Warner Brothers about a week and a half later. Um, and he said, listen, I, I just heard a cassette. I love the band. I love this guy. Tony Altito was his name. Uh, we want to sign you to a record deal. And I said to him, look, this isn't, this isn't the way it works. But I'm going to call Warner Brothers front desk, and if they connect me back to you, then we can talk. <laughs> so, so I did, and he, he picked up the phone. He said, now do you believe me? So, so anyway, that was a crazy story, and that's how we got that, a wonderful record deal with Warner Brothers. And I think I might have lost you. Have you? Oh, there you are. Okay. It, you disappeared yeah. for a minute. Okay. Uh, so, so Russ Thyred at Warner Brothers signed us. Uh, we, we got uh, the, the biggest producer of the 80s to produce us, Keith Olson, who I'm still in touch with. Uh, and Keith had produced, I mean, any hit record in the 80s, he probably produced them. Um, um, so so uh, we went out to L.A. and we did that, that tour. I mean, that, we recorded that record. Uh, I, I was already friendly with Brad Dalp of Boston, and my, my drama was close friends with him. He actually came out to L.A. and, and uh, sang some tracks on the record that we ended up not using. Um, uh, and so when the record came out, uh, we had immediately had some great response. Fool in Love was the first single, the first MTV hit. And um, Brad brought the record to Tom Schultz of Boston. And uh, they asked us to, to open for their tour. And this was the, they were the biggest actor for some of that year. This was 1987. And we played 90-something nights, and every single night was sold out. Uh, so that must, have been the, that, that must have been the third stage album? That was the third stage tour. Amanda yeah. was the big lead hit. Yeah, that fantastic song. Yeah, yeah. And they were, you know, Boston, I, I knew those guys just because everybody in the Boston area knows each other. All of the Boston bands know each other. Um, but I, I didn't really, I never really saw them perform. And they really weren't a Boston band. They didn't play around the clubs and didn't, they weren't part of the Boston scene. They just, bang, emerged, you know, with a record. And nobody had, nobody really knew them that well. We knew who they were. Um, so when we went out on the road with them, I, I didn't know what they would be like live. And they were just so, I don't know if you've ever seen them live, um, no. but that band was so strong live. And talk about every song being a hit. <laughs> um, subsequently, I've recorded a lot of things with, uh, with Brad. Uh, I recorded some things. I've signed on, on uh, a couple of Boston albums, I've doing some background vocals. And Brad and I have done background vocals together uh, on uh, several different recordings, most notably Ben Orr, who was the bass player in the Cars. Uh, we sang on, on one of his records. Um, I also sang on a, you mentioned Free, which is one of my favorite early bands. And I got to sing on a Bad, Bad Company song uh, on their uh, Fame and Fortune. It was a so song called Fame and Fortune on their Fame and Fortune record. Um, wow. So we did, we did the Boston tour. Um, most nights were... I mean, most of the big cities were three to six nights. Um, the show that we did in New England was, was nine nights. It, it's a Worcester Center. And every night was sold out. Uh, you know, maybe four nights in New York at uh, Meadow, Meadow, what is it called? Meadowlands. Um, you know, cities like Chicago would be four nights and three nights in Atlanta and six nights in L.A., you know, that type of thing. So, so it was almost like we had little residencies in all these big stadiums. Um, really fun. The second leg of the tour was, was one-nighters, and uh, uh, what a blast, you know. Uh, 
You mentioned that you, you mentioned that you, you sang background vocals on one of the Boston albums. Was it? Did you sing on? Was it the one that came after Third Stage? There was another album that came out. They bought out about the late late eighties, I think it was, which I thought was absolutely astounding as an album. Yeah, they, had, um, they had several, um, and you know, I'm uh, like most musicians, like me. You, you, you're a creator of music. You're not. A consumer of music, so so I knew of the of the third stage record because we heard it every night. When you're not touring with the band, you're not you don't stay as familiar with what they're doing because you're so busy with, on what you're doing. Um, but but Tom released two or three more CDs after third stage, and I sang backup on two songs that spanned two different records, and I wouldn't even be able to tell you the name of it. I think. Um, I won't, wouldn't be able to remember the names of them, but I sang back up on two of them. Uh, and, and because Tom Tom works uh, in, a, in a very slow scale, so I might sing a song uh, one year and I'm, it might not come out for, for four or five more years. And he might put it on one record and then put it something else on another record later. So um, uh, I, I have I do have copies of those records and they're really great. You know, they, he has a certain sound that. that He's a really meticulous guy in the studio, for sure. Um, so uh, somewhere around the end of that tour, we, we had trouble with, with uh, our name. There was another band called Fahrenheit that, that had a, a stronger claim to the name. Um, also, the, the sound of music changed. It shifted. Uh, and this, this Seattle kind of grungy sound, that all of a sudden we didn't sound like the hot new thing anymore. We had a problem with our name, and my wife got pregnant. Uh, we, we had been trying, and that happened. And so a lot of things kind of happened. This was like 1989, and um, my first child was born. Uh, the, the 80s sound was gone. The new sound was in, you know, Nirvana and uh, Soundgarden. You know, that was the new sound. And we didn't sound like that. We sounded like the 80s. So it was just time. You know, and we decided to, to, to pull back, and I started to just perform as a solo, and I went to work. I went to work at Digital Equipment Corporation. I had a little humble job at Digital, and my wife decided she wasn't going to go back to work. So a new chapter opened in our lives, and uh, I kind of worked my way around inside of Digital to the point where I had a pretty good job. And then Compaq bought us. And suddenly, I was working with partners. I was working with systems management partners, uh, working on the side, making my records. And uh, suddenly, the partners I was working for, with uh, were important to Compaq, who, who were a Windows company. Um, and then, after a few years there, Hewlett Packard bought us. And by the time Hewlett Packard was there, I had a big global uh, business development type job. Uh, working with uh, uh, Linux partners, working with the leading Linux partner, and we were we were there to incubate to see if we could incubate a, a business around Linux, um, and that was a, a really exciting global job, uh, really corporate, and I was into being successful there and and doing a good job raising my kids. Uh, I still recorded records in my own studio, and still released them and did maybe a handful of shows a year. But my focus was travel. I traveled all over the world uh, running a business for, for HP, developing a business. Um, so so after, you know, long story short, after uh, 24 years in corporate America, uh, five, about five years ago I retired. And um, I was able to retire, and I, I started focusing on my solo career again. Uh, recorded a record with a friend, John Butcher. We, we called the project FBI Farron Butcher Incorporated. Uh, and we toured around as a duo for a while. But I realized that I really wanted to, to, to work solo and develop my guitar style. I call it full band guitar style. And I wanted to finally make a record that was the way I wrote the songs. Instead of writing the songs and bringing them to your partners and reinterpreting it for drums and bass and piano parts, I wanted to make the record the way I wrote the songs. And that's what this record is. I call it full band style. 
It's a nylon string guitar, one vocal, no harmonies. But the idea is it's not a folk record. It's a rock record, and the idea is I want to make you forget that there's not a full production on the, on the record. And I think I'm accomplishing that, and I'm excited about that. That's the way I perform now. I perform well, it's, it's, as a solo. Yep. I was going to say, it's one of the things that, you know, I started listening to a lot of your music, and I, I listen to a lot of it now, because there is something powerfully intense and very, very closely personal. When you listen to your music, even the live songs, they very much come across that you feel that you're, you're contacting directly the person you're singing to. And I find that almost a unique skill. You know, I mean, your song Deja Blue, you know, I know you perform it a lot, but it's an absolutely powerfully wonderful song. And what I like about it is it's one of the, your work, it grows on you because you appreciate the musicianship and the singing. And at different times, you see different things in the songs, which, which is incredibly powerful. I mean, I just thought I'd say that, that I just, I'm a huge fan of your work, you know, and uh, I think it's quite incredible. Now, in terms of the new album itself, I don't know, what would you prefer to go into discussing the new album, or would you prefer to discuss the influences that you've had over the years? Because I know there's a whole list of individuals that in recent years, that you're, you're finding, you're writing your songs about. Which way would you like to approach it? Well, I, I, um, influences, um, you know, there, are, there is a very short list of artists that if they release a record, I'll, I'll get it, I'll, I'll listen to it. And in some cases, I'll study it. Sting is one of those people. Joni Mitchell is one of those people. Um, not not a lot more, you know. Maybe uh, definitely Steely Dan. You know anything that that um, that they do, I'm going to listen to. Uh, I think that those artists are, are super compelling. Other ones too. I really love Taylor Swift. I think she's. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I mean, I think she's absolutely incredible. I mean, as a songwriter, just incredible. I'm interested in your Joni Mitchell thing though, because I picked this up once or twice when I was listening to your music. I mean, I particularly like the Joni Mitchell song, Amelia, and the way in which she plays the guitar in that. And there's similarities with your guitar style. So it's kind of jazzy, and, and, and I, mean, I know she worked with Jaco Pistorius and people like that, so she had the top jazz musicians that she worked with. But your style is very, very similar. And I, I, I mean, that's fascinating to say that. I, I think that, I, I think she's an alien, you know. Uh, she just there's a video on online of her as a young woman and she has such a honest look and she's just sitting in front of a room of people and she's strumming a dulcimer but she's only got three strings on it and she's playing this song I think it was Chelsea Morning and it's not like anything else in terms of style it's, it's just her own style it makes sense completely from a structural perspective as a song, but it doesn't have the same structure that most songs have. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just such a beautiful thing. You know, I'm just thinking, how, where did she get that from? Uh, I, I think the same thing of, of, of uh, you know, Sting. I, he's, he's just, uh, anything he does is going to be interesting in my view. Um, but, again, as a creator of, of music, I'm not a consumer. And so I, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a fan as much as I would say I'm interested in, in what they're doing. And I'd like to try and, and there's more, there are more people too. Um, but the big, I think the biggest thing that happened for me was when I retired, I wanted to get that, uh, you know, prosperous corporate look off of my frame so I could be a, be a musician again. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of airport photos and morning meetings uh, you, you tend to morph towards the way businessmen look. Um, so anyway, I, I, start, I found a, a route uh, around my neighborhood. It's a five-mile route that I walk every day, and I started to listen to lectures, just whatever with comedy routines, stand-up, anything, science lectures, philosophy lectures, the, 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 the thing that really, the first thing that really killed me was I, I saw a silly little cartoon, 
It was a cartoon voice. I didn't watch it because I just would listen as I walked. And and it was an explanation of the double slit experiment. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'm 50-something what at the time, and I never heard of this. How could that be? So I started to listen to related related type of you know, lectures. And I thought to myself, the, the implications of this would blow my mind. And I started listening to, you know, I, I, I listened to you know, Robert Lanza. We had talked about, he, he wrote the biocentrism book. Um, you know, the double slit experiment, if this is true, then what else could be true, you know? And I started to, my worldview started to shift really dramatically. Uh, and it's, it's almost like for the first time in my life, when I was younger, I was trying to be a rock star. When I was, you know, a little bit older, you're trying to raise your family. You're trying to be successful in, in your corporate role. Uh, it's almost like you don't have time for yourself until until you passed all of that. And now I was able to focus on just learning, um, not weather and climate, you know, <laughs> learning stuff that I thought was interesting. And um, I, I started listening to things that you were doing on YouTube, um, uh, you know, different different authors. Um, Peter Russell was was somebody that just you know uttered two or three sentences that made me say, "Wait a minute, what?" Uh, Terrence McKenna, Alan Watts, and they all were coming at it from different perspectives. You know, Alan Watts was a was an academic. Um, Terrence McKenna was a uh, Hallucinogenian, right? He was he was a mushrooms guy. Um, Robert uh, Lanza is a, a stem cell research guy. He's like a world famous stem cell research guy. Peter Russell is a physicist, um, and I, I just started incorporating the, their viewpoints uh, in 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 my songs. Not not talking about those things, but letting those things inform the subject. Um, an example of that is Terence McKenna was somebody who would say that, you know, um, language plays an important part in, in our in our reality, in our awareness. Uh, we we give we give names to nouns. And once there's a name for something, we can start talking about it. We can start understanding it. If you know, a lot of uh, uh, industries have have arcane names to different shapes or to different types of tools, and you're not even aware. It's not even part of your existence. But once you learn about it, now suddenly it is. Um, and it, so, so I have a song um, that's on this new record, and it, it derives from that kind of discussion, or those discussions about language and how language creates reality. Uh, it's a so-called new word. I need a new word that says how I feel about you, right? It's a love song. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea is that I can't, I can't talk to you about how I feel about you because I don't have words. I and mean, I need to invent the word because love and beauty don't do it. They don't say the word. And so that, that kind of whole discussion thread helped me come up with the lyrics to this new, new song. And I think, it's, I think it's a fantastic song. It's a simple song. And it's not about esoterica, it's about love, but it's informed by that. And so all, I, I believe that on this record, all of my songs were deliberately structured that way. When I, when I look back on songs I've written in the past, I realize that that's true as well. Uh, you know, Deja, you write, you talk about deja vu a lot and, and out-of-body experiences, and I've had those. Uh, I've had a near-death experience. And... Deja do you want to tell? Do you want to tell us about that? Do you want to tell us about either the the NDE or the OBE that you've experienced? I, I will because because I think they're great stories. But you know, deja deja blue, the color of love, is informed by things like what you're talking about deja vu and out of body. Um, but it isn't about that. It's just informed by that. It's really about empathy for a friend whose heart is broken. And, and I'm saying, yeah, I. Now I feel it too because I've been there. Right? Um, uh, when I was uh, in, like a younger guy, I was in uh, before I was in doing original music. I was away somewhere performing, and 
we went to the, the local lake to swim, and someone that someone in the band had the idea, hey, let's swim from one, you know, the floating platforms in the lake to do another one. And I started swimming, and I got stitches in my side, but I couldn't breathe. And I started to go down, and I remember fighting and fighting, and I remember saying, I'm not going to make it. And I remember just floating down and seeing it get darker and darker. And, and you know, you have that, give, you have that, okay, let's see what happens now feel. Like you actually stop fighting and you give up and you disappear. And, uh, and during that disappearance, it was weird, you know, um, it's all the things that people say. You have, you have this sense of, uh, I had I had a sense of timelessness. It was almost as though, and you know, we can talk about time too. Um, I had a sense that there wasn't any time, and that everything was now, and that and that and that uh, nothing was over, right? I had a, I didn't have a sense of oh my god, it's over. I had a sense of what happens now, and suddenly everything was happening now. Everything that everything that ever happened was right right there, and. Uh, it wasn't flashing. I didn't have a sense of it flashing. It was just all there. Um, and it was strange. And the next thing you know, I felt my feet scraping on the ground, and somebody had come and fished me out on a, in a boat in a canoe, and I had, had me hanging off of the inside of the canoe. Um, <clears throat> and I remember coming to in a circle of faces around me uh, and feeling really weird the whole day. I played that night. Um, didn't, didn't go to the hospital. I played that night, but uh, that that was a that was a game changer for me. And um, uh, I've since then I've, I've at least three or four times a year I have that sense of like almost like I'm watching myself. All of a sudden, beep, I have that deja vu thing. Um, and sometimes I actually try to have that. I try to encourage that because I want to know more about that. I want to know where it's coming from. Um, I don't have a good sense of that, but one of the things uh, that uh, Peter Russell said that, that made me stop, it really rang a bell with me, was he was talking about um, time and space. And, and he, he said, you know, if we're going to talk about, if we're going to talk about space, if we're going to talk about the speed of light, for instance, he said, we have to think of it from the perspective of light. And from the perspective of light, uh, as you approach the speed of light, you get increasingly slower. And at the speed of light, time stops. And if time stops, then there's no space, right? So light is everywhere. Light's not traveling. In reality, light is, is, right? And we experience just a little sliver of that as what we create as light. But the light that we see is light that we create internally. You know, that's that's not light that's out there. Um, so, so his whole his he, he ends that sentence with all that we experience. I mean, there's no spaces and there's no places and there's no time. There's only our experience, and our experience is internal, and it's create self created. You know, we create it. And um, when it's over, it's not over. We're, we're, like, we're like the energy that powers whirlpools. You know, we, we, water passes through us, air passes through us, substances pass through us. Um, the energy that is us has nothing to do with the stuff around us, you know. Even when I was a little kid, I, I always thought that, that, you know, things are, um, what's the word I want? You know, entropic. You know, they they immediately begin to disintegrate. Everything does, um, except invisible things like like thoughts and feelings. You know, those, those things stay with you. Those are the things that that you create. And um, even as a little kid, I had a sense of that. People would say, "Oh, you have five senses," and I'd say, "But what about feelings? You know, my feelings—that's a sense." They don't count that. We don't count that in our culture. But to me, that's the thing. Um, and so I, I try to incorporate that kind of thinking in my 
in my writing. You know, I have a song called The Powers That Be. And that song is just like, we're the ones with the power. We, we've got the muscle. We're the authority. Um, you know, every thought and idea is a miracle. You know, and, and that's what we're creating in this, in this experience. We're creating, we're creating the expansion of that which is everything by, by coming up with new ideas and thoughts and feelings. Those are all completely unique to all of us, and that's the thing. The metaphor for that is this vis visible light expansion that, that, that our senses detect, our telescopes detect the universe is flying apart, right? It's expanding, but it's not expanding because we see dots of light that change color, because that light is internal. It's changing because we are creating new thoughts, you know, and we're the powers that be, and that song... It's a very simple song, but it's informed by all of this stuff that, that I've been able to absorb um, as a guy with, with his own time on his hands, you know. Um, so I'm excited about this record. I'm excited to be in your show and to, to connect with, with your fantastic audience. Are you kidding me? Well, it's one of the, you know, there's so many things that you discuss there that, that uh, have fascinated me for many, many years. Um, the idea of perception, the idea of um, the way language, as you rightly say, structures the way we perceive the world. You, you may be aware or not that there is the concept called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which was, was postulated in the mid-60s, I think, whereby there's an argument to say that whatever we perceive, the way our linguistic structures work is how we perceive them. So therefore we perceive through language, and it's language that hones the way we see things. Then we have the individuals like yourself, and there are many individuals I've spoken to, including a couple of previous guests on this show. I mean, we had Gary Lackman on the show a few months ago, who's Gary Valentine, who was the lead guitarist of Blondie. And he was explaining to us that the song he wrote called I'm Always Touched by Your Presence, Dear, was actually to do with he had a telepathic girlfriend who was aware of what he was doing when Blondie were on tour. And she would phone him up the next day after he'd been up to things, and she'd say, I saw you with that girl last night, and that's what that song is about. So singer-songwriters like yourself actually hone an idea and, and change it in some way to make it more acceptable, but there's this subtle personal experiences. Then we had Pia Rubessa, who was um, one of the first, he was in one of the first bands to be signed by Virgin America. He's a Canadian guy. And he had a near-death experience on stage where he was electrocuted um, like, a, like a fool. He actually uh, touched a keyboard that was live and had a whole near-death experience. And to me, it is always fascinating that people like yourselves, once you've had one of these experiences, the whole world changes and the materialist reductionists can bang on till the cows come home that this is all there is. And they know this is all there is because this is what science tells them all there is. But it's self-evident from experiences that this isn't all there is. Consciousness is prime. And again, I think your points about the idea of inner light is, is intriguing. I don't know if you've read my book, The Infinite Mind Field, but I have whole sections there on biophotons and the way in which biophotons are generated. And again, if you're interested or anybody else is interested, I strongly suggest that you check out the papers by a Hungarian researcher called Professor Istvan Bokken, who is doing some incredible research in terms of, of the generation of, of biophotons within the brain. So clearly here we have, we're starting to move out of this kind of structure that we have of materialist reductionism. In other words, the logic of materialist reductionism is if something cannot be explained by material reductionism, it doesn't exist, therefore we ignore it. But of course, within quantum physics, as you've said, in the double split experiment and the superposition and various other ideas, clearly there's something deeper here that sometimes we don't have, as you rightly say, the words for. We don't have the words to describe these sensations, but they're just as real. And I think it's so important that the singer-songwriters like yourself out there that are really getting these ideas out to the general public so they subliminally pick up the subtlety of what is going on here. You know, so... I, I've reached 
No, I go. The point. I I reached the point where I I don't have any doubt about this. I I feel as though I've come to the conclusion. I'm not I'm not searching for. I'm not wondering about this. I I think this is definitely the way way it is. Um, and and I do think that you know th- this is not taught in schools. I think that um, I think though that this is changing. Uh, I, I can sense that it's changing, and I think that it's going to be obviously true to the next generations. And they're going to they're going to be thinking this new way, and they're going to say, "How could people think this old way? That this is all there is? It's clearly not." Um, so yeah, I I mean I'm not trying to change. I'm just trying to write material that that is simple and rings true, uh, and and is true to me. Uh, um, and so that's why I'm not talking directly about this. But but I think that that this worldview, you know, is um, is true and and will be picked up by people. People will notice this as they start to become you know enlightened. I don't think there's anything spiritual about this. I think that this is. Mm-hmm. Scientific, you know. I, I envision, I envision this experience as a big lab box. You know, you see the box, and you have the gloves. You put the gloves on, and you experiment. Well, we're all, we're that's us. We're all the fingers. Uh, we're all we're, we're one guy, and we're all the fingers, and we're not supposed to be fighting. We're supposed to be having experiences, and and that's that's how I liken it. You know. Um, and I think that that's, I think that that's clearly true. I don't think it's spiritual. I don't, I'm not a religionist. You know, I think that this is, this is sensible. This makes sense. And they have, they have, uh, you know, the big questions, the big bang, the big bang is when we're conceived. You know? Spot on. I think one of the major problems here is that I think your point about future generations will look back on this generation of science and they will look back as a similar way to the way in which 19th century scientists look back at the Aristotelian science and that paradigm. And they would say, how could they not see? How could they not understand that consciousness was prime? How could they not see that the mysteries of consciousness, how the brain functions, the binding problem within the brain, you know, the idea of um, the black holes, the way in which this is this is probably some form of internally generated hologram that we're existing within. And again, this is not this is not spirituality. I think you've hit the nail on the head. You and I are not religious. I'm not religious. and I never have been religious. I find religion nonsensical. Spiritual being spiritual is also the wrong term. It's being deep thinking. It's actually questioning behind the questions. I find, for instance, what frustrates the hell out of me in my new book, Opening the Doors of Perception, I discuss hallucinations. And you'll find that people will explain certain experiences, like an out-of-the-body experience or a near-death experience, as a hallucination. But then you would then ask the question, okay, Mr. Scientist, okay, Mr. Neurologist, explain exactly what an hallucination is. How is it, for instance, that when somebody has an hallucination, there are two hallucinations going into me. And I use the argument in the new book, and I say, there's an individual who describes to Oliver Sacks, I think it was Oliver Sacks or Ramachandran, I can't remember which two it was, and he, 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 he has a, a, a hallucination of a monkey sitting on the lap of the psychologist. Now, there are two hallucinations going on here. There's the hallucination of the monkey on the guy's lap, but there's also the hallucination of exclusion, because effectively the monkey is occluding the guy's lap and where the monkey is, it's occluding what is behind the monkey, if this makes sense. So there are two things here taking place. And they say, oh, it's an hallucination. We've given it a nice label. So we're coming back to language again, aren't we? The idea of the language, we give it a label, preferably with a nice Latin term or a Greek term, and therefore it proves that we know what we're talking about. But of course we don't. Because we don't do it, you know. And it's, it's schadenfreude. It's, it's not schadenfreude at all. It's, 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 it's um, hubris. You know, it's the idea that we have explained everything. And it's all nice and neat. And that's why people like Lanza, you know, he's a very brave individual, Lanza, because he's putting his his reputation on the line by making these statements. And like even Alexander with his near-death experience, you know, Alexander didn't need to come up and tell people exactly what happened in his near-death experience, but he does. And what happens is they become criticised. 
they, they, you know, you can't, you're not allowed to do this. Whereas people like you and I, we have the freedom to really ask the really big questions. And um, I think you are one of the ideal guys that is asking these questions in an incredibly subtle way. Um, I'm just now interested in, in, in some of the tracks on the album. You know, we've got about three or four minutes left, I think. So is there, are there any kind of tracks that you'd like to, 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 to discuss and let people know about to watch out for on the new album that you think that I can give you the background to this song, which will make it more interesting for you? Well, the, the, uh, one of the songs is Don't Believe Your Eyes. Right? Um, it's called Don't Believe Your Eyes. When they tell you everything is all right, when, when you can smell the smoke and feel the fire, it's not about what you see. You know, I think that people tend to you know, show me, right? It's not about that. It's about what you feel. And that's what that song is basically about. I have another one that, that has been going off a great live called True Story. And it's, you know, my sister said to me one time, you should make a gospel record. You know, and I thought for a second and I said, that's, that's, what, that's what I'm doing. I'm writing my gospel, you know. My, my records are my gospel. Um, and that's what we're all doing, by the way. So be, be, you know, pay attention to that. You know, do it, do it with intent, because, because we're all writing our story, our gospel. So true story is me. It's, it's everything I see and everything I am, and everyone I know, and every song I hear. Uh, I'm, I'm writing. I'm writing. That's the story I'm writing, and that's what the song is about. It's, it's kind of very meta. And, uh, and it goes on for great because people listen to it and they laugh and they think, you know, wow, <laughs> I guess I'm doing that too. You know, that's what we're all doing. And um, I have another one called uh, Wound Up World, um, which, is, which is kind of a rocker. And, uh, and it is a wound up world. And, and it's wound up for all the wrong reasons. You know, nothing can, really can go wrong. And uh, this song is just about, hey, be kind to your mind. Um, and sit back and relax, you know. Uh, and that goes back to what we said at the beginning of this conversation. When I write songs, I, call, I have a guitar in every room, and I walk around the house, and I don't try at all. You know, I write what comes easily to me. When I record, I, I definitely practice to be precise. But um, when I'm writing, I don't practice guitar. I practice... I write the songs. That's how I practice guitar by playing the songs. And um, uh, I, the, my big mantra is not to try. It's to just let it happen and don't finish the song until it's ready to be finished. And just be open-minded and just work at it all the time. And all of a sudden, you mentioned Deja Blue earlier. I, didn't, I had the chords and the melody to that song. And I didn't have the Deja Blue concept. And I was calling it, I had a working title, something else, something empty that rhymed. You know, I had lyrics that were empty that rhymed. And I kept thinking, like, no, you can't do that. You have to wait. And one day I had one of those experiences where you felt like, wait a minute, I've, I've done this before. And I just thought about the idea of seeing somebody who's heartbroken and that, that empathy coming from them makes me feel like, okay, I know exactly how you feel. Like I call that deja blue. And that's, that's the color and nature of love, you know. Um, so, so all of a sudden, I went, oh, I'm so glad I waited until lightning struck because I think I have something that's, you know, I think that's a song, this an example of a song that I have that I think is as good as any song. Another one like that is Old and Young from my Old and Young CD. And I wrote that when I left Hewlett Packard. One of my friends said, um, so what's next for you, Charlie? <laughs> I tell this at my shows. I said, well, I think you're going to sing my songs and play my little nylon guitar. He said, well, gee, you're, you're too old for that. And, and then I, I said, well, maybe I am, but that's what I'm going to do. And, uh, and so I wrote the song Old and Young, and the whole thing is just um, – I finally arrived, you know, this is what, this is the time in my life where I'm going to have, you know, um, I'm going to have those moments that you can't have when you, you're younger and you have responsibilities. Not that I don't have responsibilities, but I have, 
I have my own time and I have my own um, program now, you know. And so I, I, a lot of my songs are about that, and I'm, I'm really psyched about um, about this record. You know, I have a song on it called Always, and it's a love song, but always means forever. It means eternity. It means no time, you know. And uh, that, that's 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 where I'm coming. The Big Bang. The Big Bang. I mean, really, that's the cornerstone of, there's no Big Bang. <laughs> you know, it's always, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't start. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. And that's, that's, I turned that concept into, into a love song. And then I think it's working great. Wow, fantastic. I mean, one of the things I found <laughs> as I've got, got older is that you, you, you acquire wisdom because you can look back at all the experiences of your life. And one of the things I've always thought as I've got older is that when I, when I chat with younger people, the one advantage I have is I've always been their age, whereas they've never been mine. So we are in a position whereby you gain wisdom and sometimes it's very difficult to explain what you're trying to say. And I think music is one perfect tool because as you rightly pointed out earlier on, it contains emotion. You know, music contains emotion within the chord changes, within the way the music works, the way in which certain musical elements cause his sadness. A single cello playing, for some reason, is incredibly sad, but nobody could explain why it is it's sad. It just seems to be. And these are the kind of deeper things that I think you're trying to discuss. Now, very quickly, to finish off now, so how can people contact you? How can they find out about your music? How can they purchase your music? So please, you know, let them know, because I'm sure there'll be a lot of people out there that'll be going, this guy is really doing some very, very deep stuff. And believe me, guys, he is. So let them know how they can contact you and, and everything else. Well, I have a website, charliefarron.com, um, and... My music is out on, uh, and all of my CDs are available there. Uh, all of my studio CDs are available um, on all of the streaming, you know, iTunes, Amazon, all of them, right? So, so it's available anywhere you can get music. I should be there. Um, but all of, all of my CDs, I don't have things like my collections, things like my live CDs. I don't have in the uh, in the streaming. Those you can get uh, at charliefarron.com. And uh, you can send me email on charliefarron.com. I'm on Facebook. Um, I'm on YouTube. I'm on, uh, now I'm on, how do you say it, Ubu, Ovo? Uvo. I'm not sure. Uh, Dear could probably explain this. I just call it Uvo, but uh, I have no idea how you pronounce it. Sorry, I was going to say, I've got, I've got no idea how you pronounce it at all. Dear will probably be the expert on that, so I just call it Uvo. <laughs> Obviously, LinkedIn, you know, I, I, from my HP is it's like almost to the point now with text, with voice to text, um, my, my phone turns my phone messages into texts, Facebook messaging, you know, I, LinkedIn, I start to lose, like, I remember hearing from you, but I don't know, was it email, was it, it was it a LinkedIn message, was it a Facebook message? So at some point, I'm going to have to start limiting these because it's just there's too many channels coming in to pay attention to. But uh, I, I try to stay pretty active uh, on, on all of these. You know, I'm maxed out on Facebook, but I have, I have a, a, a site for my business, F-Man Media. So Facebook slash F-Man Media uh, is, I think there's no cap to those kinds of sites. Um, no, there isn't. No, there isn't. That's the major advantage of them, isn't it? Right. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. It's been wonderful talking to you. I've been looking forward to this for so long because it gives me the opportunity to talk about the things I love, which is my music and everything else. Right. OK, everybody, if you're interested, the next show, our guest will be Dr. Thomas Beck, um, who is a researcher into altered states of consciousness. Um, and I'm really, really looking forward to talking to him next month as well. So, Charlie, thank you very much for, for spending an hour with us and giving us a glimpse of what it must be like to be a, a rock musician, which is just so cool. <laughs> and I, I can actually um, enjoy it at a distance, as it were. So thank you very much. And thanks again to our lady in the background, uh, Dia Nunes, who is um, down there in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and thanks again, and thanks for listening in, folks, and uh, tune in again soon. Okay, thank you.